The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in that portion that we read at the beginning out of the fifth chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. I read again verses 20 and 29, verses 20 and 29 in the fifth chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Those were the words spoken to these apostles by the angel of the Lord. Verse 19 tells us that the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And then in verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, we begin the consideration of this incident in the life of the early church and of the apostles in particular last Sunday evening. It's a remarkable incident again. Indeed, all these incidents of the life of the early church are full of wonder and of amazement. And the reason for that, as we've been seeing, is this. That here we are reminded that we are in the realm of the supernatural, the divine, the miraculous. And uh, these incidents are recorded here and put before us in order that we may be perfectly clear about that. Now, last Sunday night, we looked at this incident in this way, as it is a portrayal of unbelief. You see, the story starts by saying, Then the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Then? When? Well, after the remarkable things that are recorded in the earlier part of the chapter. After the sudden and striking death of Ananias and Sapphira, And after the extraordinary signs and wonders that were wrought among the people by the apostles. It was then, in the light of that, that these Jewish authorities, the high priest and the party of the Sadducees, are filled with indignation and annoyance, jealous, envious fury, and throw the apostles, these two in particular, but here all the company, were thrown into the common prison. And we analyzed what we are told here about the nature and the character of unbelief. We did that, of course, because we were desirous of showing that uh, that is still the truth about unbelief. Unbelief doesn't change. It is always the same. And here we saw the central characteristics of unbelief always, even today. But now tonight we are looking at this same incident from a different standpoint. And we are looking at it now tonight as it tells us once more something we've been told several times already in the earlier chapters of this book of what the message of the church really is. How she's ever got this message and therefore what the church herself really is. If we really want to know what what it is all about and how you explain the whole story of Christianity in the world, how it ever came to pass that one was regarded as nothing but a Jewish carpenter, an unlettered, ignorant man, becomes the central figure of all human history, and his cause and his people become the dominating force in the world in many centuries that have passed. If you want to understand all that, I say there's only one thing to do, and that is to come back here to the story which we have in this book at the very beginning of the foundation of the Christian church, how she ever came into being and how she was ever enabled to do what she did. And nothing in that connection is more important than her message, her message, the character of her message, because it is the message that has always done the work. The church spread as the result of preaching and the preaching of this particular message. That's how it's happened. So nothing can be more important than this. And I think you'll all agree with me when I say that all this is particularly important at this present time. 
Because here surely is the great and the central problem. People are asking, why should they listen to this gospel? Why should the Christian church go on? Is the church just an anachronism in this modern world, or can we justify her continued existence and persistence? Why should they listen to the gospel, they say? Now, the vast majority won't listen, because they say it's got nothing to do with them. It's irrelevant, and it's out of date, and so on. So we've got to face this great question. We've got to be able to answer people when they put the question, why should we listen to you? What right have you got to address the world? What right of you with the world as it is tonight to stand up and just go on repeating that old message? That's the challenge which we have to meet. And we are very ready to do so. Or to put it in another form. Why is it that people are in such trouble about this gospel? There's still a lot of discussion about it. Though people don't attend places of worship, they like to listen to the discussions and the interviews and they read the articles. It's still a topic of interest in in the press and on the television and so on. It's what they call, I believe, a talking point. Well, now then, but they're in great trouble about this, and there's a great deal of confusion with respect to this. Now, why, why, why is this? What is the trouble? And I want to suggest to you tonight that this is a matter that is dealt with in this particular incident that we're looking at. And what it emphasizes is this that the difficulty about listening to the gospel is not so much a difficulty with particular aspects or statements or emphases in it. The real problem is with regard to the whole nature of the gospel, the essential truth of the gospel. It isn't so much men's particular approach, it is their whole approach that really constitutes the difficulty at this present time. In other words, I'm suggesting that the difficulty with regard to this matter of listening to the gospel is really a total misunderstanding. And what makes our problem greater is that this, unfortunately, is not only true of the world that's outside the church, but it is obviously true of many who are inside the church. Their books show us that. Their articles prove that to us. And what they say in their utterances make us doubly certain of that very fact. Now, the difficulty is this in general. That everything seems to have become vague and indefinite and uncertain. And the great idea is that because we are living in this present atomic, scientific age, whatever you may like to call it, that our first great task should be to seek for a new message to seek for a message that is adequate for the modern men. Now, that is the whole general impression at the present time, that whatever may have been true in the past, we are set in such circumstances and in such a position that our first business and task is to try to discover this message that will be of help and of value to people at a time such as this. Now, there, you see, is a basic question, and what it raises is this. It is ultimately the whole problem of authority. What is our authority in these matters? What authority does the Christian church possess? For I am here to contend that the Christian church can only justify her continuance in terms of one particular authority. And if she doesn't make sure of that, and if she isn't certain of that, well then... As the phrase puts it, she is finished. Authority. It comes out in all these early chapters of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. These men, these simple, unlettered, ignorant men, were able to act with authority. They are confronted by a man, a lame man, at the beautiful gate of the temple, over 40 years of age, who had never walked in his life. They look at him and they say, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he did. The authority. But in a few hours, as it were, they're standing on trial before the great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Most imposing array of dignitaries and legal authorities. And here are these poor men. They've got no advocate. They haven't briefed anybody. They haven't got the money to do so. And they knew furthermore that nobody could represent them and defend them. They stand forth themselves and they speak. And they don't hesitate to look straight into the faces and the eyes of these great authorities and say in the mouth of the apostle Peter, 
You rulers and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent men, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the children of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, that this men stand here in the presence, stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Authority. Even in the presence of these great authorities, the Sanhedrin. Well, now here, you see, we get a kind of repetition of that, because they've been arrested once more, and they've been thrown into prison. But they're delivered miraculously from their imprisonment and are commended by the angel, Go, he says, go. Stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And then Peter, addressing the authorities again, says, We are to obey God rather than men. Well, now then, this is the whole question of authority. And this is, I say, the central difficulty at this present time with regard to this whole matter of the gospel. This is where the confusion comes in. Outside the church, inside the church. Very well, let's consider what we are told here. The first thing we are told is this. The church succeeded, the church did what she did. She turned the world upside down. She became this great power in the earth and amongst men. Why? Well, because she realized that she was delivering the message of God. Now here's the thing that comes out, you see. The angel comes to them and he says, Go, stand, teach all the words of this life. And that's the defense of Peter. We ought to obey God rather than men you tell us not to preach. You remember that's the charge brought against them. Did not we straightly commend you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. The answer is, we must obey God rather than men. Now, here, you see, is the point at which we must always start. That is the character of this message. It is, as we read there in 1 Thessalonians 2, the gospel of God. Now, this is not, in other words, a theory which has been worked out by men. See, that is where this whole notion of seeking after truth, of trying to discover a message, is so completely contradictory of what you find here plainly taught in the early church, the thing that is equally plainly taught in every period of Reformation and of Revival. This is not the discovery of men. This is not the result of human thought and meditation and discussion and dialogue and delving and reading the authorities and sharpening mind with mind. It's not that at all. It's, it's something quite different. And yet, you see, this is the whole trouble at the present time, isn't it? The whole emphasis is placed upon the quest for truth, the search for truth. I could quote you great names which have been teaching this within the last ten days. They've put it in public print, so why shouldn't I say so? I read an article by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the present Archbishop of Canterbury, who was saying this very thing. He said quite plainly that the quest for faith is even better than faith itself. You see, the whole emphasis today is upon the search for truth. And this is the thrilling thing about living in the 20th century, that we now, with all we know, and all the past is gone, we now are in this position. We are in the new realm as we are sending men up into outer space and are discovering things about the moon. So we are discovering fresh truth, new things about ultimate reality. And the most fatal thing of all, as he says in his article, is orthodoxy. Orthodoxy, you see, static. If you think you've arrived at truth, you're hopeless. 
It's the quest. This is the wonderful thing. And it goes on, ever extending on before you. And you're traveling and seeking and searching all your life. And that's the business of the church, to stimulate men, to seek, and go out in this great quest for faith. I remember reading a few years back on a book which put this thing very plainly and clearly. And the man actually put it like this in an illustration. He said, you know, if a man came to me and told me that he'd got a gift in both hands, one in the right and one in the left, and he said, you can take your choice of whichever you prefer. He said, in the right hand, there is the reward of the quest for truth. In the left hand is truth itself. Which would you choose? He said, I would undoubtedly choose the gift in the right hand. He prefers the quest for truth to truth itself. Now this is of the essence of the modern position. That this is the marvelous thing that men are dissatisfied but that they're out in the great adventure. Seekers and searchers after the truth. Trying to arrive at this great faith, this truth that is going to give them happiness and joy and peace. They'll never arrive there, but of course they'll have gone a bit further and their successors will be able to follow. And on and on you go. But you're always traveling. Now that's the essence of the modern position. You see, it's the exact opposite of what we read here. Go, stand, teach the people all the words of this life. This is a message from God. This is not something that man arrives at. This isn't man's discovery. This isn't man's intuition. This isn't man's seeking. This is something that is given by God. Now, this is said, said so endlessly in the scriptures that it's almost impossible to understand how any man claiming the name Christian can say anything else. Take, for instance, that great opening statement of the epistle to the Hebrews, which puts it in such magnificent form. God, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, etc. But you see what he's saying? God speaking? And can't you see, at once we've crossed the great watershed. We are no longer in the realm of man uh, seeking and such. That's all right when you're dealing with scientific matters. Quite all right if you are trying to explore outer space and know something about the surface and the moon. Quite all right. Let man experiment. Let man seek. Let man try with his process of trial and error. It's absolutely all right. He sets out and he discovers. Wonderful. But you know, in, in this realm, it isn't that. It's the exact opposite of that. God spake in the past in sundry forms and divers manners, parts and portions through the prophets. Now has spoken. You see, we are now here in the realm of revelation. And you notice how the apostle put it there in writing to those Thessalonians. He tells them how glad he is about this. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because... When ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And did you notice this wonderful way in which he put it? But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, you see, it's the exact opposite of saying, I, Paul, as the result of my researches and my thinking and my deep meditation upon life and its attendant problems, have come to the conclusion. And I'm starting a new theory. I'm bringing out a new idea in my latest book. I'm starting a new school of thought, the school of Paul, as you had before of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Zeno, and all the rest. Now then, I'm starting a new school of thought. It's the exact opposite of that. He says, I was allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. And again, in writing to the Corinthians, he uses this kind of language. He says, we are custodians and guardians of the faith. The foolish people in Corinth, you see, were comparing and contrasting Paul and Apollos, which was the better preacher and so on, which had got the better message. He says, you misunderstood the whole thing. 
He says, Apollos and I myself, we are nothing but stewards of the mysteries. We haven't discovered anything. We are not preaching what we think. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. We are but stewards of the mysteries. We have simply been given the great privilege of handling this. And he tells them how careful he was, lest he might in any way misrepresent it. It isn't his. This treasure have we in earthen vessels. It's a message that has been committed unto him. Now, that is the teaching right away through. You see, take these men, these apostles. Isn't it monstrous and ridiculous to think of Peter and John, who were just ordinary fishermen, and the others, as the authorities rightly said, were nothing but unlearned and ignorant men? Isn't it monstrous to suggest that these were preaching a message that they'd worked out for themselves, that they were like the Greek philosophers, just simply propounding, and that they were pro the proponents of a, of a new view of life. The whole thing is so ridiculous that it's amazing that anybody can possibly believe it. What happened to them? Why is it that Peter and John can stand and address the Sanhedrin as they did? Why are they all doing it here together? Yeah, there's only one answer. They'd been given their message. They'd followed with this blessed Lord and Master for three years. They'd heard all his teaching. They'd seen what had happened to him. And he had told them after his resurrection what exactly to say. He'd taken them through the scriptures. He'd given them the message. And they were simply repeating what he had told them to say. He had put them in charge of his message. And of course, what is true of them is true of the Apostle Paul also. You will find in the 26th chapter of this book of the Acts of the Apostles, the apostle gives an account of his own calling into the ministry, how he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. And this is what he said. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand on thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I shall appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, and to whom now I send thee to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That was his calling. He says in Ephesians 3, a dispensation of the gospel was delivered unto me. Ah, last of all, he says unto me, was this message given unto the least of all saints, that I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the, the church of Christ. And on and on they go saying this self-same thing. Well now, my dear friends, are we clear about this? I don't stand here Sunday by Sunday to give you my own ruminations on life during the past week. That's not preaching the gospel. I don't come here and simply try to tell you how I see things. I am here as an expositor. It's all here before me. It's in this book. I'm simply putting this to you in my own language, trying to make it plain and clear. It's not my message. It's God's message. As it was the message of the early church, it is my message this evening, and it has been the same message throughout the running centuries. And that brings me to my second point. Because it is the message of God, the gospel of God, God's speech to men, because it is that, it is therefore unchanging. You see how relevant this is to the modern position and the modern difficulty. This is logic, isn't it? If it is a message from God, well, then I say it is an unchanging message. We sang just now, O word of God incarnate, O wisdom from on high, O truth, unchanged, unchanging. Unchanged. Unchanging. Why? Well, because it is from God. But I can give you additional reasons for saying that it is the same and the unchanging message. This was the message that saved men in the first century. It is the message that has been saving men in every other century. And it is the same message, therefore, in this century. As men don't change, they must have the same message. The church came into being by preaching this. She was given the authority and the message. And this is the only message. 
It is the only way whereby a man can be saved. Peter has already told that to these same people. Neither is there any other. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. It was the only thing that could save men then. It is the only thing that can save men now. Now, this is not a matter of dispute and of argumentation. This is a question of fact. Nothing else could save people then. Do you know anything that can save men now? With all our advance and increase in knowledge, why is our world as it is? We don't seem to be very successful at saving society, at saving the world, do we? And we can't save ourselves. Men were then victims of drink and sex and drugs. They still are. And they're in no better position to overcome these things now than they were then. It's exactly the same. There is only one power that can do this impossible thing. It's this. It's the same message. And so, you see, how ridiculous it is to think that this message is in any way affected by the changing fashions in the thought of men. Nothing is more characteristic of men and his thinking than the change of fashion. I could give you many, many illustrations to demonstrate that. The popularity of certain types of teaching. You had it in the ancient world. You had the rival schools of philosophers, and you've had them ever since. And there are great changes of opinion. Well, I could illustrate it in the last 100 to 150 years. You see, until comparatively recently in the realm of science, the scientific outlook was purely materialistic. It's no longer that that's scoffed at now, that's laughed at, that's ridiculed. We've got a new physics now, astrophysics, whatever else you may like to call it. And it's so different from the old one. You get fashions of thought, changes of thought. Anybody who's ever been a student has discovered this, the textbooks that some of us used 30, 40 years ago, and more perhaps in studying medicine, they're hopelessly out of date. Indeed, I heard of a group of doctors in discussion not so long ago, in which it was solemn, this was solemnly asserted that a man who had been qualified medically before 1945 couldn't possibly understand modern medicine. Well, there it is. You see, changing fashions, schools of thought. At one time, you see, the one cure for everything was to bleed a man. And you had your barber surgeons, and everybody was bled, and they undoubtedly killed thousands. You don't do that now. There's a different view now. You see, these things change constantly from age to age and generation to generation. And, and men are foolish enough to think that because their ideas change and there are fashions in their thought, that this must be true of all thought. But my dear friend, if you start by realizing that we are concerned here not with men's thought but with God's thought, there's no change. God cannot change. God is. And God is what God always was. There is no beginning, there is no end. He is the eternal I am. And when he speaks, it is eternal truth. It is everlasting truth. It is unchanging truth. Because it is the utterance of God himself. And so I say this is very important for us. And this is where so many go astray today. New message for this atomic age. New message for this scientific, this post-war world. Modern man and his needs. My dear friend, it's rubbish. Man remains the same, as I've told you. His needs are the same. His difficulties are no greater. Men were in difficulties about this gospel at the beginning. They're still in difficulties about the same gospel. There is no change. And the gospel remains untouched and unaffected by the changing scenes of time because it is the gospel and the message of God. Go, stand, teach the people all the words of this life. You tell us not to preach it. We are to obey God who has given it to us rather than men. Very well, that brings me to my next proposition, which is this one. That it is a particular message. What do I mean by that? Well, that it's not something vague and uncertain. Go, stand, speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Words. 
Nothing vague about this. Nothing uncertain. Not something nebulous. Not simply philosophic musings or poetic outpourings. Not fancies and imaginations. Not just playing with ideas and a quest for truth. Go, stand, speak. The words of this life. The gospel, in other words, is a clearly definable message. There's no difficulty about knowing what the gospel is. Of course, I know when I say that today, I'm regarded as being really beyond the pale in every possible sense. The idea that you know, well, it's the quest for truth. That's the thrilling thing, the seeking. My dear friend, there have never been a church. If that were the position, that's all right for men who pass through Cambridge and have studied philosophy and so on. They can do these things and they change, write books to one another. And it's a marvelous, exciting thing and the intellectuals follow it all. But what about Tom, Dick and Harry in the street, I ask you? What do they know about this quest for truth and reality and the philosophic arguments and disputations and all the cleverness? It's got nothing to give them. But you know what I read in the Gospels is this. The common people heard him gladly. And there's something wrong with a church that doesn't appeal to the common people. And we've all got to face that. The masses of the people are outside the church in this country. Why? There's something wrong with the message, my friends. The common people heard him gladly. It's a clearly defined message. There's no difficulty about that at all. This is something that is said everywhere. Let me give you one or two examples of it. Listen to this Apostle Paul. Listen to the Apostle Paul uh, putting it in 1 Corinthians 15. He's reminding the Corinthians of what he preached to them. Moreover, brethren, he says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was seen of Cephas, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, etc. It's a clearly defined message. And he says, you see, I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not me to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. In other words, you see, this is not only a clearly defined message, it was the one message that was preached by all these apostles. Peter and John preached it and the others. The apostle Paul preached it. He didn't belong to the company that had companied with our Lord uh, during his life here on earth. He was then a persecutor and a blasphemer, a self-righteous Pharisee. But he was apprehended on the road to Damascus and given the commission, as I've shown you. And this was the message that he was given. You know, says Paul, whether it was they or I, it's the same thing. It's the same message. They know what it is, I know what it is. There is no confusion, there is no uncertainty with respect to it. But now I want to take this a step further. Oh, to me it is tragic that men and women stumble at the very approach to the gospel. And so their souls are lost and they're miserable and they're unhappy. They can't live, they can't die, and they have no hope to cheer the tomb. It's all because of this initial misunderstanding. This message, I say, is not an uncertain one. It is a certain one. It was preached dogmatically by the apostles. It has been preached dogmatically since when the church is truly functioning as a church. Now, this, you see, leads to the next step, which is this. This gospel can not only be clearly defined, it must be clearly defined. And you must differentiate between it and that which is a false teaching, and that which represents itself as a gospel wrongly. Listen to Paul putting that to the Galatians. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. How can you say that if you don't know what it is? How can you say that another man's teaching is wrong if you don't know what the true teaching is? 
If the gospel is just some wonderful feeling inside or some marvelous uh, sensation that a man gets or some wonderful hopes and fears and speculations and desires and a great uh, thrilling quest for truth, if that's the gospel and if it's the search rather than the thing itself, well, how can you say about a teaching that it's wrong? That it's not a gospel. But listen, Paul goes further. He says, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that he have received, let him be accursed. Do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not after men. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He knows what it is. It was, it isn't his own conjecture. He was given it, he's received it. He was told exactly what it was and was given the command, Go, I send you to the Gentiles and to the people. Go, speak. Exactly as these were sent, he was sent. And so he not only knows what he's preaching, he can say that anything which contradicts this is wrong. He puts it later on to Timothy. He says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And his gospel was the same gospel as that which was preached by all the other apostles. My dear friends, can't you see that these things follow by a logical necessity? It is God's gospel. It is therefore unchanging. It is therefore clearly defined. We know what it is, and we can say that nothing else is the gospel. We can speak of antichrists with the apostle John. We can denounce error and heresy and say it isn't Christianity. Anything that is vague and loose and uncertain and developing only and trying to arrive at truth is not the gospel. There would never have been the church if that were the case. But I want to emphasize another thing. Go, stand, and speak unto the people all the words of this life. And now I want to emphasize the word all. It's a great gospel. It's a comprehensive gospel. It's a many-sided gospel. All the words of this life. What do I mean? Well, you know, I read another article this last week by a learned philosopher who is an elder in a, in a church in a certain denomination. And what he said was this. He was attacking the orthodox faith. He was attacking the gospel as preached by these apostles. And he was doing so in these terms. And this is, you see, something you hear so often. There's nothing new about it. I've heard it and read it many, many times before. This was his own case. He said, now, he said, these people, these orthodox people, these fundamentalists, as he called them, he said, uh, they talk about the wrath of God. They talk about the absolute necessity of the death of the Son of God. They have their communion services, broken body, poured out blood. And they say that he had to bear the punishment of sin. He said, how terribly wrong this is, how tragically wrong. That's been the trouble, he said. People have been held into that sort of legalism for all the centuries. But now we are beginning to see through that sort of thing, and we know it's all wrong. And this is how he proves it. He said, where do you find all that in the parable of the prodigal son? You've met that argument, haven't you? Where do you find all that in the parable of the prodigal son? He said, this teaching is a libel on God. God's like the father of the prodigal son. The boy makes a fool of himself, wakes up to the realization of that in the far country, and then goes home and he says to his father, Father, I'm sorry. But the father doesn't say to him, Look here, that's all right for you to be sorry. 
But I can't forgive you like that, you know. Some atonement has got to be made. So there's the necessity of some sort of a sacrifice. It can't be done like that. No, no, we've got to put this thing right. The law's got to be set. He said, there's nothing there. The father embraced him. Indeed, he ran to meet him before the boy had a chance of saying anything. He was kissing him, surrounding him with his love. That's the message he said. In other words, you see, we are asked to believe that the whole message is the parable of the prodigal son. Nothing else. And there are others who tell us that the whole message is the Sermon on the Mount. That's Christianity, Sermon on the Mount. Moral, ethical code. Teaching people how to live. They say, that's Christianity. None of your doctrine, none of your dogma, none of all this about atonement and so on. It's just this. Now, all I'm saying is that the command the angel gave to these men was, go, stand, speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when Peter begins to do so, you see, he talks about the one whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I don't go into that tonight because I'm concerned about this whole attitude, the total wrong attitude to the gospel. Then failure to realize that it's such a big thing, a great thing, such a comprehensive thing. The whole of the gospel is not in the parable of the prodigal son. I can easily demonstrate that to you. The one who uttered the parable of the prodigal son also said, The Son of Man is not come to be ministered, but to be ministered on, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He said, Except a corn of wheat die in the ground, there's no hope. He said, So if I be lifted up, he is referring to his death. I will draw all men unto me. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of God, Son of Man, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see how monstrous it is. Just as the whole gospel is the parable of the prodigal son, and unless you find a thing there, it's not true. That's the tragedy of the age in which we live, my friends. We are commanded to preach all the words of this life. What does this mean? Well, it means this. There is a sense in which the gospel is simple. But there is a sense in which it is the profoundest message that has ever come into this world or ever can come. There is a sense in which it's simple, in which you and I, in our weakness and helplessness and hopelessness, simply believe. But you don't stop at that. And these men are told to go and stand and preach all. And this is to me one of the most marvelous things about the gospel, is its comprehensiveness, its largeness, its greatness, its many-sidedness. What am I talking of? Well, you see, this is a great body of truth. It's a great body of doctrine. It is a great theology, if you like. It is a marvelous, biblical, systematic theology. Parts and portions. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past them to the fathers. He did it in parts and portions. He revealed this, then that, and on it goes. This great, comprehensive truth. This corpus of truth. This body of truth, this marvelous thing of God. What is it? Well, you see, it's the whole message of the Bible. And that is where the world has gone wrong, you see. It doesn't believe the Bible. It's got no authority. It trusts the human thought and speculation and theorizing. But these men were preaching what had been given all the words of this life. What's the message? Well, it's something like this. You see, you have to go back and start with creation. This is concerned about the creation of the world and the creation of men. You know, let me say this, at the risk of being misunderstood, I think there are many intelligent men kept outside the gospel because of this kind of failure on the part of true believers sometimes to present the thing properly. The gospel is not just come to Jesus. It ends there, it doesn't start there. That isn't the beginning and the end. Sub stuff, emotionalism, is it? No, no. 
The words of this life start by asking a question, what is the world? Where does it come from? What is man? Why is he as he is? That's a part of this message. It starts with the whole creation, the whole cosmos. It's here. You can see it for yourselves. You see, this the words of this life include the Old Testament as well as the New. Oh, I know the moderns don't like that. They don't like the Old Testament. They don't like the God of the Old Testament, they say. They like the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he believed the Old Testament. You see, that's the tragedy we are in. Men no longer have any authority. They say things at random. It's the last thing they've thought of us. This is a part of the quest for truth. But what can you? What have you got to live on? What have you? No, no, it's the Old Testament as well as the New. When you start in the beginning, God, creation. And then you see a very vital part of this preaching is the fall, the fall of men. That's a part of the words of this life. Why does a man need salvation? What's the matter with us? Why are we as we are? No, your gospel has got to deal with it. And it does, and it tells you why things are as they are. It tells you about men disobeying, rebelling, falling, getting into trouble. And then it teaches the judgment of God upon that. And that the world is as it is chiefly because of man's sin and God's judgment on that sin. That's why we are as we are tonight. That's why our world is as it is. And then... It introduces this grand redemption. You know the difficulty about preaching is time, isn't it? Fancy saying a thing like that. Grand redemption at ten to eight. My dear friends, I want not only hours, I want weeks, months, years. I want an eternity. Grand redemption. Listen to some of these resounding phrases. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Do you know what that means? That's a part of the words of this life. This full Lord, complete gospel. Oh, let me give you another great statement of it by the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. If this kind of thing doesn't do you good, my friend, there's something wrong with your mind apart from your heart. Listen to this. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The called. Do you know anything about the doctrine of the call of God? The call of God, this effectual call that Paul spoke about in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 which also worketh effectually in them that believe this effectual the call of God. And then he goes on to say for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things, says the Apostle? My answer is glorious, marvelous, worthy of God and of him alone, this complete, comprehensive, glorious salvation. And then, of course, final judgment. The coming again of the Son of God into this world to judge it in righteousness and to pronounce the eternal verdict. On those who have believed this message, blessing. On those who have not and have rejected it, eternal perdition outside the life of God. But it doesn't stop at judgment, restoration. The whole universe to be renovated, to be redeemed. The great regeneration when the Son of God shall come again out of heaven back into this world and restore this fallen creation to its original perfection, and even heighten its glory. That is something of the content of all the words of this life. It is a comprehensive gospel. And I close with this word. All and every part is essential to it. What do I mean? Well, I mean that you and I are not to choose and to select. To take out what we like and to reject what we don't like. 
It is not for us to approve or disapprove of any part of the gospel. It is altogether of God. It is no part of it of men, and therefore we are to believe it and to accept it as it is. You and I are not to choose in what we like. I always tell people they've got to read the whole Bible and try to do so once a year at least. The whole Bible, not your favorite passages. You don't select. It's all the Word of God. Read it all. You fail to do so at your peril. But if this is not subject to our choice who are Christian, how much less so is it subject to the choice of the men of the world who is outside and his modern thought and his modern knowledge? What has your modern thought and your modern knowledge to say about these things? I know it's got a great deal to say about outer space and about the surface of the moon. It's got a great deal to say about gadgets and instruments and how electricity does this, that, and the other. All right, give it 100%. I'm not here to quarrel with it. All I'm asking you is this. What has your modern knowledge to tell you about yourself? About man? About the object and the purpose of life? About how to live? About how to conquer the world, the flesh, and the devil? How to cleanse your nature? What's it got to tell you? The answer is nothing. But that is the very subject matter of this. And so, you see, we are to preach all the words of this life. We don't choose. Did you notice how Paul put it so wonderfully there in preaching uh, to these uh, Thessalonians? He reminded them of this. He says, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. You know, a preacher who wants to please men, he doesn't say certain things because he knows they won't like them. Paul says, I didn't do that. For neither at any time used we no, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory. The Apostle Paul never tried to wheedle his congregations. He never tried to get round them and sort of tell them affecting stories and throw in a bit of humor in order to be put them right and put him right with them and please them and so just get them and so establish his own glory. He did the exact opposite. He preached an unvarnished truth, unpleasant to the natural men, knowing that the natural men hated it. He didn't choose. Neither are we to subtract from this gospel. But that's what's happening today, isn't it? People are subtracting from the gospel. You see, they say we are now scientific and we can't believe the early chapters of Genesis. Science proves that they're not true. Actually, it doesn't, of course. They say, but evolution proves it. What is evolution? It's just a theory. It can't be proved. It never has been proved. But why am I concerned about this? I'll tell you why I'm concerned about it. This is a whole gospel. And if you reject or subtract any part of it, you'll be in trouble with the whole of the rest of it. It's all very well to say, no, I think men has evolved out of the animals, but I still am a Christian. I still believe in the doctrine of salvation. Well, how can you? What does man need to be saved from? Why does he need to be saved? Has he ever been perfect? Has there been a fall or not? How many people fell if there has been a fall? You see, you're immediately in trouble. The whole of your gospel hangs together. And so people, in terms of science, we can't believe that. And then they say they can't possibly believe today this teaching in the Bible about the wrath of God. Oh no, they say, we, we want the gospel and we are prepared to believe the gospel. But I can't believe what is called the wrath of God. Paul says to the Romans, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Of course, they say that's, that's because he was a Jew and had been brought up as a Pharisee. He believed in the God of Sinai, the God of the Old Testament. He didn't know the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of Jesus. There's no such thing as wrath in God. The parable of the prodigal son proves that. That's the modern argument, isn't it? You take out the wrath of God. Well, then all I ask you is this. If you take out the wrath of God, why did the Son of God ever die? Why did he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem? Why did he say he must die? Why did he say that righteousness couldn't be fulfilled if he didn't die? Why did these apostles preach it was essential? 
No, no, be careful, my friend. If you subtract from this gospel at any point, you'll always be in trouble. Let me add this on the other side. You must preach all the words of this life. You don't take from it. You don't choose what you say. And you don't add to it either. It was all here. It was all given to these first apostles. The Roman Catholic Church claims that she's made discoveries since. She claims indeed that she's had things revealed to her since. I say there is only one answer to that. And let's be clear about this in days when men and women are thinking so loosely about these matters. Listen to Jude putting it. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once and forever delivered unto the saints. It was all given to these first apostles. And there has been no addition. There can be no addition to it. Mary is not a co-redemptrix. We don't need the help of the saints who are in glory. We don't need and must not be utterly dependent upon the ministrations of priests. You're not saved by being baptized. You're not saved by taking the communion service or by a priest pronouncing absolution. No, no. All the words of this life, it was all given to the original messengers and there must be no addition to it. The test that the early church applied to any book that should be put into the canon of the New Testament was the test of apostolicity. The test of canonicity is the test of apostolicity. If a thing can't be traced to the apostles, it's not true. There is no addition. There never has been, there never will be. What saved the first Christians is the same message and the only message that can save any man at any time. This is a complete whole. Be careful. You leave out a part and you'll be in trouble with the rest. It'll be no longer consistent. This is a, a complete and a consistent whole. It starts with creation. It ends in the final restoration. And every step and portion and part is essential to this perfect mosaic of God's plan of redemption. It is entire. It is whole. Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And how glorious it is. Seen there in its completeness in the face of Jesus Christ. That's why I tremble to leave out anything. That's why I always try to give it you all. It's all in him. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is, God has treasured up in him all the treasures of his wisdom and his knowledge. And his power and his everything. Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. It's all in this blessed person. Look at him. Look at him in his person, look at him in his living, look at him in his teaching, look at him in his dying, look at him in his burial, resurrection, ascension, seated at the right hand of God, sending the Spirit, and the promise of his coming in all the glory of his perfection to wind up the affairs of earth and to hand back the glorious kingdom to his Father when God shall be all and in all. My dear friend, that's the gospel. That's the message. All the words of this life. Do you know them? Do you believe them? Are you rejoicing in them tonight? In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.